Coming up next on Legislative Review. Our member store used firefighting foams that contain PFAS for the response to low likelihood but high consequence petroleum fires. Firefighting foams fallout becomes a hot topic. There are currently safer and effective alternatives available and we should eliminate the current exemptions and existing law to protect our communities. We know that people experience suicidality on a continuum and so having the right option for the right patient at the right time is essential because patients need more options than nothing or inpatient psychiatric hospitalization. Suicide prevention measures gain traction. Just because we say it's illegal to purchase from the internet doesn't mean it's not happening. And the legislature looks to ban flavored vape permanently. Hello, I'm Troy Kirby with Legislative Review for January 22nd, covering the 2020 legislative session. Today's episode includes bills on flavored vape bans, suicide prevention measures, and chemicals in firefighting foam. Senator Carlisle, members of the committee, I'm Jan O'Donnell, staff to the committee, and before you is Senate Bill 6360. Toxic chemicals in Class B firefighting foam were discussed at a public hearing on January 22nd in the Senate Environment, Energy, and Technology Committee. Supported by the Port of Seattle and the Washington State Council of Firefighters, Senate Bill 6360 would remove a 2018 exemption that aircraft rescue, oil refineries, and chemical plants have, which allows them to store and purchase banned Class B foam. As you know, in 2018, legislature passed a law to phase out PFAS containing firefighting foam for local government agencies. This phase out has been and continues to be successful in getting rid of a highly toxic chemical that has already contaminated several Washington state communities drinking water. Uh, cancer is leading cause of line of duty death for firefighters and avoiding unnecessary exposures to chemicals that can lead to cancer is a critical prevention strategy. There are currently safer and effective alternatives available and we should eliminate the current exemptions and existing law to protect our communities. At the Port of Seattle, we have been actively involved involved with the industry to find a solution and are working with our partners at the Federal Aviation Administration to encourage implementation of new fluorine-free firefighting foam. While the federal law currently requires the use of firefighting foam that includes PFOS chemicals, our airport director, Lance Little, sent, an, sent the FAA a letter in 2018 urging the FAA to aggressively pursue a fluorine-free option. The petroleum industry was against the bill, saying that the foam was necessary to save lives. Our member store and use firefighting foams that contain PFAS for the response to low likelihood but high consequence petroleum fires. Our industry shares the concerns associated with the use of PFAS and is actively limiting that use to emergency situations. More broadly, our members collaborate with manufacturers to test and support the search for a viable replacement foam, as well as national efforts with American Petroleum Institute, American Fuel and Petrochemical Manufacturers and ACC. Our primary objective is to protect the life, environment, and property in our communities in case of an emergency incident. Supporters of the bill mentioned that the foam's after effect was polluting local drinking water after being used in a fire. This bill is the next step to continue this legislature's groundbreaking work to move away from the use of firefighting foam that contaminates water and threatens firefighter health. Um, our draft chemical action plan drafted by Ecology reports that civilian airports, petroleum refineries, and other petroleum facilities are some of the largest users of PFAS containing foam, all uses that were exempted in, in the 2018 legislation and all uses that can come with a very heavy cost. What we've seen in incidents in other states recently is that when these foams are used in incidents, the result is permanent pollution of our waterways, fish, and wildlife. The primary concern that we have is groundwater contamination, correct? Correct, that's correct. And, and the vast majority of that groundwater contamination was due to training that was mandated uh, both at military bases and at certificated, certificated airports, uh, along with testing of equipment uh, and, um, and, and just general uh, playing with the foam. Unfortunately, everybody thought at the time that this was relatively benign to the environment, and we now know differently. And gross substitute Senate Bill 5395, Secretary will read. Meanwhile, the Senate floor discussed ESSB 5395 on January 22nd, which would implement comprehensive sex education to K through 12 public schools. This is about consent, and it's about safety, from the predatory behaviors of other people. Let me tell you what this bill does not do. It does not direct teachers 
to instruct students on how to have sex or how to promote sexual activity. The curriculum is age appropriate and it's adopted by local school boards as any other curricula is done across this state. We do have significant concerns about the state mandating uh, sex education across all 295 of our school districts across our state. We feel that that is a significant erosion of local control and that those uh, closest to an issue like this are usually in the best position to make decisions that are in the best interest of their communities and that really is the responsibility of our locally elected school boards in these communities. Criticism of the bill rests in the curriculum for kindergarten through third grade which the opposition says is too graphic. But the question is who teaches it? Who teaches it, Mr. President? And I think, I think while I understand there are opt-out provisions, um, we much better supported opt-in. I think, I still think when we're talking about teens, um, I've met with students, I agree that in teenage years, those conversations are important. I don't think they should be in kindergarten. The arguments we're hearing today about all school districts have to, have to be um, saddled with this challenge. Uh, parents' rights are taken away. Um, that those school boards ought to be able to pick curriculums. That people ought to be able to opt in versus opt out. Every single one of those arguments, Mr. President, took place in 1988 in this body, having to do with just this, this, this kind of an issue, an urgent issue. Uh, lives are at stake if the skill sets are not developed that are present in this bill. And uh, I think that we could remember, or we could take, take heart in the actions of that previous legislature because the sky did not fall. The world did not end. During the interim, OSPI did a survey. Uh, and I'm sure they thought that it would come back, that the public was all for this. But no, it did not. And uh, the good senator from the 7th District mentioned the percentages. 58.4% said no. Only 38.3% said yes. And we had over 10,000 responses. So it was a significant survey, and I think this legislature ought to spend a little more time listening to the people. We can quote the numbers, we don't need to, but we can quote the numbers of, sex, of, of the um, in growing uh, numbers of sexual assaults, of the growing numbers of sexual diseases in, in uh, our teenagers. Uh, we see the harm in it, in the confusion that kids have about their sexuality. Mr. President, there are 28 yeas. The Senate 21. voted 28 21 in favor of the bill, passing it, moving it onto the House. The title of the bill will be the title of the act. Welcome to the January 22nd Senate Health and Long Term Care Committee. The Senate's Health and Long Term Care Committee held a public hearing on January 22nd on Senate Bill 6254, which would ban the sale of flavored vape products. Governor Jay Inslee imposed a temporary ban in 2019, which ends on February 6th, 2020. It's been mentioned 70, uh, several times we're in the midst of a youth vaping epidemic. Um, in 2019, um, about 27% of all high school students nationally had reported recent use of e-cigarettes, e and of them, about a third reporting using e-cigarettes on 20 or more days in the past month. Then they will go to the internet and, and just so you know, just because we say it's illegal to purchase from the internet doesn't mean it's not happening. We should not be spending our school meetings and PTSA money fighting this health crisis. We need to be focusing on educating our kids. To put it simply, this bill is not is not only an extinction level event for adult vapor stores only, it will effectively shut down the sales of any vaping hardware and nicotine e-liquid in every licensed store in this state, convenience stores, gas stations. And actually, you've just given the biggest gift you possibly could to big tobacco. Let's start with Jerry. Suicide prevention measures were examined in the House Health Care and Wellness Committee on January 22nd, including House Bill 2411, it would increase the training certification requirements for counselors and therapists concerning patients at risk for suicide. Another aspect of this bill that I wanted to mention that uh, is really important is it um, 
says it's not just enough to do the same training every six years, but it really emphasizes advanced training and evidence-based practice to build a smooth gradient of interventions that providers have to offer their patients and to make sure there's an effective continuum of care because uh, we know that people experience suicidality on a continuum, and so having the right option for the right patient at the right time is essential because patients need more options than nothing or inpatient psychiatric hospitalization. Thank you for watching Legislative Review for January 21st, covering the 2020 legislative session. Follow us digitally on Facebook and Twitter, or watch Legislative Review on TVW Nightly at 8 p.m. and 11 p.m. with the Weekend Review Show on Friday and the weekend. I'm your host, Troy Kirby.